Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Um, so I'm going to introduce Gary O'Toole, uh, an east-west integrative approach. Um, and it's in the, air, in the era when Western and Eastern astrological traditions seem to be uh, pitted against each other, their zodiac calculations seemingly at odds using both systems in, in some ways. Can we act antidote to the divisiveness um, and a more potent blend to boot. So we're going to introduce Gary O'Toole we'll talk about uh, an east-west integrative approach. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. And um, thank you for having me at this conference. Um, I'm really excited about sharing this um, and even more excited after hearing a talk earlier <laughs> by Ricky Blythe. And that really got me stoked because we have a lot in common. Um, and it's not a, um, your usual approach is kind of what I think I'm going to call now a hybrid approach. I was driving, I was driving here from Stansted yesterday in a hybrid car. I just, I always have these funny little moments to myself. A hybrid car driving to a hybrid conference and thinking, wait a minute, this is actually hybrid astrology I'm doing, this east-west. And why would I do that? Basically, I, just a little bit about me, um, uh, just so you know, um, I've been studying Indian or Vedic astrology, as been termed, um, since 1996, and I haven't really ever trained in Western astrology, um, which has actually been a good thing. So I haven't got too confused about following the tradition. However, I am a Westerner. I live in Ireland. I'm originally from England. And basically, I have studied a lot. I've read a lot of books, Western astrology books. But that has allowed me to have this sort of in integrative approach. Um, and even growing up between Ireland and England, like born in England and being brought back to Ireland and then moving back to England and used to spend all our summers in England, I felt like I was always like having one foot in either camp. And this is actually what's happening in astrology now as well. And I'm the same in any kind of thing, in any position. If I'm in a company, working for a company, I'm like, well, wait a minute, this company does it this way. You know, so this is why I'm bringing it to astrology as well. So um, let me just move the screen on, hopefully. So before I get into the meat and veg of, of it, um, basically we have, of course, the sun signs we're all familiar with, Western astrology and the tropical signs, um, but we also have the 27 lunar mansions of Indian astrology. Now, as a, an Irish person uh, studying an Indian tradition and all of the myths and symbols surrounding that, I've had to integrate it. So that's one way to start that, you know, you basically have to anyway. Um, and actually, you know, we're all integrating both anyway, is my opinion, because whether you call yourself a Western astrologer or, or a Vedic astrologer, or whatever it might be, um, both systems are influencing each other all the time and have been for a long, long time. So there's no such thing as a purebred anymore. Okay, so we're all, all hybrids. Okay, um, so sun signs and lunar mansions, I'm going to talk a little bit about a couple of the signs. I'm not going to go through all of them because they're 27 how they really give us an x-ray vision of the sun signs. So you might know your Aries and Taurus and Gemini and so on, but the lunar divisions of those signs give us that kind of in-depth analysis. So I'll talk a little bit about the myths and symbols maybe of Aries and Taurus to begin, and some of the stories that we tell ourselves about these two signs and how um, they play out, especially in terms of timelines. Because another thing that really grabbed me when I was first studying astrology is that especially when I had my chart drawn up by um, an astrologer who was practicing then Vedic astrology. Am I going too fast? No. I'm a bit like Zippy for the first 10 minutes and then I'll settle down. <laughs> uh, she was basically transitioning from Western astrology to Vedic astrology when I met her. So she drew up my chart and my timelines and she gave me my timelines. I call them now, I call my astrology timeline, astrology. And basically these are the, the dashas, they're referred to in the Sanskrit word to mean circumstance. And these are calculated from many different vantage points, but especially the moon. When I get into the lunar mansions now, this will make sense. And um, literally my whole life is mapped out in these sequence of planetary cycles. And I was like, whoa, oh my God, my whole life is here. So then it wasn't really ever about, and it still isn't really ever about, this is my tropical chart. This is my sidereal chart. I'm this, I'm that, I'm all of it. We're all signs, as my teacher Pearl Finn used to say. We have all of the signs. But what is happening? That we can't argue with. 
what has happened in your life thus far, what's happening, what will happen. And that's why Indian astrology is generally more predictive, it's seen as, than Western astrology. More, more so because of these cycles that I'm going to refer to, and I call timelines. So just start with Aries. So basically, and I'm putting Aries in brackets because there's a, um, this notion as well that basically we, when we say Aries, we really should actually qualify that. What we say, when you say Aries, normally if you're Western, you're probably going to mean tropical Aries, right? That's we how we have to qualify that. But if you're a, an Indian astrologer, you're more likely going to mean sidereal Aries, even though there's overlap. Some Westerners do uh, sidereal and some Indian astrologers do tropical. And more and more Indian or Vedic astrologers are doing tropical. Um, it's a growing trend. So this is like an x-ray vision of Aries. So if you know anything about Aries, you'll know that it's impulsive, it's intense, it's passionate, it's disciplined, it's a driving force, and it's quite sharp. And it's actually because of these three signs. <laughs> so this is the x-ray vision of Aries, and it adds to whatever you know about Aries and Aries being a fire sign and being the first sign, the initiative, initiative, uh, initiative sign. It's the first to start. But looking at the lunar mansions and the Sanskrit words here now, so I have to give you a few words. Ashwini, Varani, and Kritika, when you have an A in dash, like accentuates the A sound. So it's a double A. So Ashwini, Varani, and Kritika, and these three words actually make its way into our English language. We don't know about it. Ashwini, not so much, even though if you're a fan of Ayurvedic herbs, you'll be familiar with Ashwagandha, and it's a, it's a rejuvenative. And so the symbol is a horse. So it's supposed to make you as strong as a horse, this herb. It's an adaptogen. But basically, it's what makes Aries so impulsive and fast and strong, usually, right? Unless you have Saturn here, I guess. <laughs> The next one then is Barony, which is the Yoni, the vulva. And this is what makes Aries so creative. And to create anything, to give life to something, it requires a whole lot of discipline. And bearing down, this is where the word Barony, where we have this word Barony, bearing down, to bear something. Well, that's where it comes from, to bear something. And then the last one is Kritika, where we get the word critical, or critique, or to cut, literally means to cut. And so this is why I call this the sharp one. And so there's a sharpness to Aries too. Now you might notice, you might not be able to see it there, but zero degrees to 13 degrees, 20 minutes is the first portion of Aries, that's the lunar division. The next one is 13 degrees, 20 minutes to 26, 40. They're all divided 13 degrees, 20 minutes, each lunar match. But you'll see the last one here is 26, 40 Aries to 10 degrees Taurus. And this is where the lunar mansions not only tell the stories of the sun signs, but they tell the stories of overlapping the signs. So I can see <laughs> you're nodding there and we can talk more about this. But basically, there are only three points in the zodiac where the signs do not overlap. The lunar mansions don't overlap the sun signs. And I'm going to talk about those in a while because they're really important junctures or gaps in the zodiac. Uh, but you could think of this portion here, the sharp portion, as the actual blade or the point of the blade in Aries. And the rest of the handle is in, in Taurus, which I'll talk about in a minute, which is a more practical earthy domain of Kritika. So those are the three. Now, just to mention, you see underneath Uranus in tropical Aries, 2011 to 2019. But Uranus is in sidereal Aries from 2016 to 2024, so it's a few more years. So there's an overlap, you can see in both zodiacs, right? So from 2016 uh, to 2019, that's the overlap. And I'm going to use the outer planets more so for this talk because that shows really, it's easier to see because they take a lot longer and we can see the effect. And it's quite clear to see the effect. So as tropical astrologers are referring to Uranus in Taurus right now and messing up the whole financial sector, we Indian astrologers or Vedic astrologers are using the North Node Rahu to explain that because it's in Taurus. And by the way, that's always the case. You're going to have the outer planets being, you know, um, or the lunar nodes substituting the outer planets for most Indian astrologers. I use both and they tell the whole story, um, but I'll, I'll explain more about that in a while. But Uranus is actually in sidereal Aries in 2024. And the story goes with that is as it was before in tropical Aries. And this is the best integrative way. This is the advantage I have as 
a sidereal astrologer listening to all of the tropical reports for years sometimes. I just have to keep my ears open for years and years and years and listen to the tropical reports and gather all of that information. And then as soon as it goes into the sidereal sign, I'm like, okay, I got this. So that's another integration. <laughs> now, tropical astrologers can do that with Indian astrology by doing it with the nodes because the nodes are opposite. <laughs> so that's why I believe, this is a theory of mine, that Indian astrologers are ahead of the game with the nodes, the lunar nodes. And they have a lot more myth and symbolism around the lunar nodes than Western astrology. But if tropical Western astrologers or anyone who uses tropical, listen more, just keep your ears open to reports about the lunar nodes, Rahu and Ketu. And you will basically have all of that information then when they then do, as next year, for example, uh, the North Node and South Node Moon, they've already been in Taurus and Scorpio for over a year in Sidereal. So we've been talking about now for over a year, resource issues, blocks to supply chains, not because of Uranus, because of the North Node Rahu in Taurus. There are always, every single time, I've seen it for like years, every single time you're going to have the North Nodes substituting the outer planets. And that's why a lot of Indian astrologers don't use them. It's almost like you get away without using them. And I didn't start using them until about 10 years ago because I started writing mundane reports. And then I realized, oh, I'm going to have to really use the outer planets here. I can't really explain every single thing that's happening on the planet without using them. And once I added them, I was like, it went to a whole other level. But just to say that's an integrative approach, it's not usual to do that. And I would be classified therefore, and I really don't like being labeled too many things, but a Neo-Vedic astrologer has to be Irish, who studies in Indian astrology, Neo-Vedic astrologer, but basically an astrologer, full stop, right? But I would be classified as a Neo-Vedic for doing this. So Taurus then, I'll just refer to the first section of Taurus, the first 10 degrees, which is still this Kritika lunar mansion that now we're gone from the blade, maybe into more the handle of the blade. And it's one of only two lunar mansions, Kritika, that is seen as mixed both sharp and soft, because each of the lunar mansions have classifications, swift, sharp, soft, um, all of these things. So this is only one of two that is both. And, it, and the other one is also overlapping Mars and Venus's other signs, Libra and Scorpio. No coincidence. The two lunar mansions that overlap Aries and Taurus and the two that overlap Libra and Scorpio are seen as soft and sharp. And basically, Think about the handle of a blade. Well, not just the handle of a blade, but a blade, which is one of the symbols. It's about cutting something out. This is where the moon is exalted. It's about cutting out negativity as well. And so Kritika has this whole symbolism. The, the ruler of this, the deity that rules it, is called Agni, the fire god. So it's heat, it's sharp, it's cutting. And basically, you can use a blade to either heal someone or kill someone, <laughs> right? And a fire to do likewise. To, like to heat something, to heat your food. It's all about digesting things as well. And so there's a softness about it in, more so in the Taurus division. Now, again, look at Uranus. What's Uranus doing? It's in tropical Taurus 2019, 2026, as I said, but it'll move into sidereal Taurus 2024 to 2032. So there's an overlap 24 to 26. So that'd be interesting mid-decade. But currently, the North Node Rahu is transiting Kritika. We moved in there very recently. And one of the very symbolic things that I saw, and you usually pay attention on the news when things like that happen, when planets transition into a sign, it was on the news that some guy was like taking out a knife at some other guy at a fuel tank somewhere in the UK. I was like, that was pure symbolic of this sign Kritika. And this kind of, the North Node, by the way, kind of represents the sort of prime primal sort of instinct, sort of fear-based response to things. And when it involves itself with Taurus, um, it's this kind of uh, grabbing as much, as many resources as possible. And that's why we're seeing around the world this kind of supply chain issue. Vaccines included. You know, that's a major issue with countries hoarding vaccines. It's a supply issue, basically, but it's greed, because that's what the North Node Rahu represents. But again, Uranus is the substitute, or Rahu is the substitute for Uranus, I would say. Um, but they're both telling the same story. So I'm not going to go through all the signs. As I said, it'd be way too much to go through all the 27 different symbols and all the gods associated with each, but just to give you a, a view of each of them so you can see. And if anyone is interested in 
getting their hands on these. I have a deck of cards here, like they're like, you know, cue cards are like, you know, to learn a bit about them. Uh, you need to go, you need to go to my website though and go, become a patron to get the physical cards, but I'll show you where you can download the app for free um, in a minute. So the next sign then Gemini, uh, we have, if you if we go back to Taurus just for a minute, the last sign of Taurus is, um, or sorry, Taurus here. You have, first of all, the sharp one, then the comforting one, the middle of Taurus is the most, it's the, it's the moon's favorite lunar division, Rohini. Um, and it's very um, opulent. <laughs> Let me put it that way. This ancient symbol is a cart, but modern day would be like the BMW kind of thing. So anyway, the next one is River Shear, and it's the movement now transitioning again from one sign to another, from Taurus to Gemini, because it's split evenly between Taurus and Gemini. And it's what makes um, Gemini so interactive. It's taking Taurus into Gemini realms, which is more about interacting and sharing of resources as well, and enjoying the resources. Like you don't just drive a BMW on your own, right? You like you want to drive someone with you, or you want to see people with it, right? So it's kind of that interactive thing. So um, Gemini, the curious one, the purposeful one, the truthful one. I'm not going to go through all of these, but I want to show you the the gap that we haven't seen yet, because all of the lunar mansions have overlapped signs thus far but it comes to an end here in Cancer for the first time. So the end of Cancer, after you've gone through the four elements, Aries, Taurus, Gemini, Cancer, you're now coming to the end of Cancer and the end of a lunar mansion, and there's no overlapping signs. And so we have to start again in Leo. And so this is something I'll refer to in a minute um, called Gandan. It's a, a section that divides or gap and there are three of them in the zodiac. So we're starting again in Leo. And what do you think about Leo? I mean, I think these symbols fit nicely into Leo. Mm -hmm. Crown, the Shivalinga, the bed. So you have the first portion of Leo, which is all about lineage and power and entitlement and being born into a tradition, whether it's money or whatever. We all are born into some uh, some entitlement, whatever our entitlements are. But then it's about enjoying those riches, which is what probably the most luxurious sign. And it's also about the arts. It's about leisure time in the arts, the former fruitful one, that means. And the Shiva Linga obviously represents the sex, but that's only a one baser instinct of Shiva Linga. The higher instinct of the Shiva Linga is basically creation. Next one then is commitment. This is where you take all of the enjoyments and resources that you have and you share them out. And it, that then leads from Leo to Virgo. So you have all of the resources in Leo and then you share them out in Virgo. And so that's what begins Virgo, the committed one. It's about being more uh, responsible as well in sharing things out and dividing things out. And Virgo does that very well. The next sign then is uh, the handy one, literally has the needs hand, Virgo, center of Virgo. It's all about management. And then the next one then is the brilliant one or Chitra, which is the jewel. So it brings us now from Virgo and the, the design of something, the putting the slides together in perfect order, <laughs> um, but then bringing into Libra and then actually communicating that and sharing that with people. So that's the first part of Libra. The next part of Libra is an unusual one because you would normally think of Libra as being very dependent on others, but actually that also suggests that it's very aware of their separateness from others. And so this sign here, Swati, it symbolizes sword, and it's one of the higher constellations above the ecliptic. And so it's this kind of um, cutting away and going it on your own and kind of uh, paving your own path, basically. So even though it's in the middle of Libra, you kind of think, how does that fit in there? It's perfectly in there. Um, and then the end of Libra is the doorway into Scorpio, into the nether regions. The nether realms, nether regions too. <laughs> and so this is uh, Vishaka. This is the other one I said, uh, remember I started off with Kritika being soft and sharp. This Vishaka is also the other soft and sharp one. So there's a kind of softness because of Libra and there's a dedication to a cause or to a path, but then it moves into Scorpio where that dedication becomes obsession. <laughs> so obsession then begins in Scorpio. But then after that becomes devotion, which in the middle of Scorpio is the soft inners of the scorpion, the flowering bud, the lotus flower is the symbol, coming from the root, the mud, the dirt, the grime of Scorpio, and making it a flower. 
And then the very end of Scorpio, you're going to see the same thing happen again for the second time, where both the sun signs and the lunar mansions end again. And this particular ending, this gap at the end of Scorpio is particularly hazardous. Venus is right there right now, by the way, in the Sidereus or yeah. But it's creating this kind of gap where it's kind of like when you're packing for a trip and you kind of finish what you were doing and where you were, but you haven't got to where you're going. It's that feeling, that kind of gap, jumping over a gap. But in terms of spiritual lessons here, it's obviously the end of Scorpio. It's about learning to let go of sex um, impulse, um, materialist, any kind of materialistic impulse, and moving towards the more Sagittarian truth-seeking impulse. So now we're starting again for the last round. So the last round starts with the first sign called Mula, literally means the root. And this is probably one of the most challenging lunar mansions of the zodiac. And you might think, well, how is that in Sagittarius? But if you draw a line from where our view of the galaxy is through the early section of Sagittarius, you end up in the black hole at the center of our galaxy. So it's about getting to the root of something. It's about getting clear about something. And you can only get clear about something by removing something. So it's ruled by the goddess of death. So the next sign then, when you're clear about something or you've removed, you've uprooted things, the next one then is like, um, this is the water goddess here in this sign. It's another symbol is a fan. And it's where Sagittarius becomes this kind of more buoyant uh, sense where there's a sense of um, overflowing, maybe sometimes overly optimistic and all of that. But also this fan is very symbolic of um, fanning the flames. So kind of trying to keep the passions in check as well in a way, and, and also um, elevating our passions. And then the last one, which moves us into Capricorn, is Uttara Shada, which is you have the Purva and the Uttara, literally just means former and latter invincible ones. And this one here into Capricorn takes all of the belief systems of Sagittarius, all of the things we think about and the high morals and high minded things and applies them practically. And the symbol of the element fits very well. But one of the things here with the fan also is the other symbol oftentimes is a, um, the tusk of an elephant. And then, then it links it to the, the, you can see them come in pairs a lot as well. Purva and Uttara are pairs. So the first one will be a tusk breaking through, carving a path, and the elephant then charges through in Capricorn. Now here's Pluto. So we have three more here, and we have the next one, Shravana, where Saturn is currently transiting this year. It's all about going on a path, going on a journey. And the, the last one there then also is about making declarations as well and manifesting something. It's a very, uh, I call it the abundant one. But in general, Capricorn, this is where we're coming back to when we started with Aries and Uranus and Sidereal Aries right now in a square to Saturn in Sidereal Capricorn. It's really telling the story more about well, it's quite clear on our TV screens and in our life that this this conflict and square between individual freedoms and the needs of the many, Aries, Capricorn. But that translates in tropical zodiac to the financial issues of Taurus squaring the Aquarius Saturn and all of the kind of new technologies that have to come on stream now. So they're both true. Both tropical and Sir sidereal are telling us what's going on. You know, and if you don't use them both, you wouldn't have got both of those stories. You wouldn't have got the full picture. So then we're going into Aquarius and, oh, sorry, and then going back into Pluto. So Pluto is actually transiting uh, tropical Capricorn only until 2024, but it's there until 2040, it's sidereal. So this is overlap now, right now. So that's no coincidence that Pluto moved into sidereal Capricorn at the beginning of 2020. It moved into um, tropical Capricorn 2008, the financial crash, but it moved into sidereal Capricorn beginning of 2020 with an actual crash, a real life, not just financial crash, but like life crashed, right? So again, they're both true. So the next one then will be, of course, Aquarius. We're continuing with this. Danishta is very much about drama and music. It's, it's about like uh, pomp and ceremony a bit as well, but it's about making something happen very much. All of the elements that are required to make something happen. Um, taking it from Capricorn, that very ambitious sign, getting to the top, you know, and then bringing it into the Aquarius kind of theme of, well, now that I've made it happen, what do I want to do with this? Well, I actually have to do something else with it. I have to break some glass ceilings here. We have to go a bit further. And so that's, this is where we get into some interesting lunar matches, the more interesting ones, the more kind of opaque and 
unusual ones from the end of Aquarius into Pisces and the age we're in now, that transition from uh, Pisces to Aquarius as well. So this first one is Shatabisha, or Shaj, depending on how you pronounce it. Um, I call it the eccentric one. The symbol is an empty circle. And it creates this sense of all of these paradoxes and contradictions, yet they're all contained in the circle. Everything is, everything can be true. This could be true and that could be true. It can be anti this and pro this and it's all true. <laughs> you know, it's this sense of like mishmashing everything and this kind of eccentricity about Aquarius. And then finally, at the end, moving us into Pisces, we're getting into even more visionary states and more um, a sense of moving beyond. And the symbol is the two-faced man. Another symbol is a sword and a funeral cot, but basically it's about cutting away what is not real and getting to what's real and into the afterlife, where we, especially when we move further into Pisces, into the ladder, the power of Adra, Badrapada means auspicious steps. So it's this moving into these mysterious steps of Pisces. And then we'll be very familiar with the last lunar mansion in Pisces, the Ravity one with the fish, because that ties in with the Christ symbolism. Um, and the age of Pisces is quite clear. But we are in the age now coming into the age of Aquarius, which means we're coming into this transition period of Purva Badrapada in the coming years. And that means that we're going to go through this need to check where are we placing our attention and what do we want because it's this two-faced two directions and having to cut away um, something to get to the truth so that was a whiz around the 27 signs Oof. okay didn't think i'd be able to do that quick um i hope and have i haven't left your head spinning but if you want to learn more about them you can just download the free app now the unfortunate thing is i don't have a um, an iphone ios they wouldn't allow me to upload it because they said none of that is anything new. Believe it or not, none of that is anything new. Okay, it's not anything new, but I thought the original artwork was something new, which I'll give you the, uh, the artist's name at the end if you want to check them out. But there's no new information about it. So it's only available on Android. So if you have an Android device or you know someone has an Android device, you can download it, find out where the moon was when you were born. That's the first step. If you know where the moon was when you were born, that's your first bit in story. And then it leads from there into the next story, which I'm going to go through now in a minute. Um, actually, let me, yeah, let me go through that first. So this is, these are all the longitudes of the signs, the or lunar mansions. Okay, but it's easy. You can just see how you know each one corresponds to when it's sun signs. Now, though, if you're used to using tropical astrology, you need to subtract 23 degrees or thereabouts. So take your longitude of your moon, whatever sign, find it here, subtract 23 first, and then find it here, and find the corresponding planet. And it basically means that when you were born and the moon was in that longitude, the planetary cycle you began was that planet, and for that length of time. Now it varies based on how far into that sign the moon was. But for, for example, if somebody was born with their moon at you know 30 degrees of Virgo, moving into the first degree of Libra, you know, it's going to be right smack bang in the middle of Chitra. And so it would be right smack bang in the middle of Mars. So that person would have been born in a Mars cycle for half to seven years. We would have only experienced half of that. So three and a half years of Mars cycle. But then it goes in sequence and it goes in the same sequence of everybody. So it's always Mars, Rahu, the North Node, Jupiter, Saturn, Mercury, K2, South Node, Venus, Sun, Moon, Mars, and it keeps going. And it goes on many levels, from day to day, year to year, every level, down to the minute, or many years. And so we all experience these planetary cycles, and therefore, all of the myths associated with all of these planets. So just give you a view again of all of the signs and how they line up with um, the sun signs, the lunar mansions, Sometimes, and these are the three sections I was referring to that they come to an end. End of Cancer, end of Scorpio, end of Pisces. The end of the water signs before you start the fire signs. Uh, according to Camilla Sutton, this is called Dandata, a well-tied knot that is very difficult to unravel. The more you try to untie the knot, the tighter it becomes. Gandante represents a knot within ourselves, a deep issue we are trying to reconcile with. So if you have planets there at those gaps, or even transiting planets, like we have right now, Venus, right now, is at this gap in the Scorpio, um, then it's maybe a tricky couple of days. But if you have that in your birth chart, 
that's a whole life issue, which I'm going to go through in as an example at the end. Um, I just want to see, yeah, there's one thing I, I wanted to highlight here. This astrologer who sadly passed away last year, Nick Anthony Fiorenza, he had an amazing website called lunarplanner.com, which unfortunately is not up any longer with all of the many years he spent uploading amazing material and graphics onto this and it's just all gone, which is so sad to see, you know, when you have your life's work and it's just gone because it's no longer out there. But anyway, uh, maybe I'll come back. I don't know if somebody's um, in charge of that. But anyway, there are four paths or feet in each sign. And this is another way of understanding how you can look at the sun signs, integrate the Indian approach to see how we can look at the signs in this way and how we see the elements. Because of course, you think of Aries as fire for several reasons, like it's the first initiatory sign, it's ruled by Mars, all of that. Springtime, all of that, right? Uh, if you're on the Northern Hemisphere. But really, we have a whole other system to actually tell us the story with the lunar mansions. And that is we divide each sign nine times in Indian astrology, or nine divisions, which is called the Navamsha, Nava nine. And this Navamsha chart, nine division chart, sits beside the main chart always, like two eyes. And without two eyes, you're not getting a full picture. And with the two eyes, you're getting the underlying strengths and weaknesses of the planets. So this is the way to divide up. The beginning of all the cardinal signs start with the same sign division. It's three degrees, 20 minutes. Each one is three degrees, 20 minutes, and it divides a whole 30 degrees up nine times, three degrees, 20 minutes. So Aries division first is Aries. Cancer the same, so on and so on. So you'll see, you might not see. If you're online, you'll see, if you're here, you will. But basically you have Aries, start off Aries, then Taurus, it goes in sequence. Taurus, next section, Gemini, so on and so on and so on. So the only reason that Aries is fire is because it just has one more fire, Sagittarius. Fire, 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 and it has all the other elements. So all the signs have all of the elements if you look at it from this kind of microscopic view. But Aries is fire dominant, Taurus is earth dominant, so on and so on. So this is another way of looking at the kind of how you can integrate them. So let's just talk a minute about the overlap. Um, we talked about this earlier, <laughs> myself and Ricky. So basically, um, yeah, I'm obsessed with this overlap. But the thing is, it's shrinking. That's the other thing to think about. What, what are future, future generations going to do with this? Because the two zodiacs are separating more and more. 72 uh, years, they've separated degrees. So in a few generations, both zodiacs are going to be a whole sign different. So we need to kind of get on board with this now. And I'll, I'll offer some suggestions um, and other people have also. But anyway, so this overlap of six degrees, um, this is the thing I've noted over and over again. When someone has the last six degrees of a tropical sign rising, it means they have the uh, sidereal rising also, right? So if you are any planets at the end of a sign in tropical, it means you have it in the beginning of sidereal. And it just means they're more obviously, and there's no disputing it, that I'm going to give you an example of one person. But I mean, I've seen it over and over. You know, for example, my son is in tropical Libra and Sidereal Libra. So there's no denying about Sun in Libra, right? But if it were in Sun in Scorpio or tropical Scorpio and in Sidereal Libra, we could also talk about those two stories. But I've got one story going on, very clearly one story. So anyway, that's okay. This is again another image by uh, Nikanti Fiorenza. Amazing image of how three zodiacs line up. So you have, of course, tropical on the inner one lined with the solstices and equinoxes. Then you have the sidereal, which is shifting back, you know, at this point. He's, uh, I think he's shifted about six degrees, yeah, six degrees. Um, but then you also have the actual constellation of zodiac, which, you know, if you actually want to look at the actual constellations, which we don't do in astrology normally, even though I've seen some people do it, uh, we normally divide it up 12 times, obviously, just to give you a like, sense of a timing to like a clock. Um, anyway. Um, I'm going to skip this for now because I want to show you that overlap again in terms of transits. So the first one is Pluto. So Pluto transit in Capricorn, tropical and sidereal. And I mentioned this already, but it's quite clear to see that when Pluto entered in Capricorn, tropical 20, uh, 2008, it was basically the economic crash. Um, but then it entered um, sidereal Capricorn in early 2020. So Pluto and Capricorn, tropical Capricorn, began the process, you could say. 
But Pluto in sidereal Capricorn continues this process and until, you know, 2040. <laughs> Sorry to say, folks. So this is one of the things that it doesn't really work for tropical astrologers. And I can understand why I've been to like through 15, 20 years of Pluto in this sign. And now you're asking me to take on board that it's actually in the sidereal sign and I have to think about this more. So I can understand why you might want to just shake it off. <laughs> but basically, they're both going on. So we need to be aware of that. The other one I took out here was a good example of like big movement. It's a Me Too movement. Tropical and sidereal approach. Jupiter transited tropical Scorpio during this whole period of the Me Too movement. October 2017 to November 2018, that was obvious. Jupiter and Scorpio really highlighted the themes, power dynamics, expanded awareness of sexual abuse cases and all of that. But at the same time, Jupiter was in Sidereal Libra, the sign before, right? So what was that telling us? Well, it was telling us about the inequality issues that were highlighted. So they're both true. Jupiter and Libra told us about the inequality. Jupiter and Scorpio told us about the sexual abuse. They're both were happening at the same time. So the other one then is Saturn represent the, at the same time as all of this was going on, Saturn was in Sagittarius, Sidereal. And in the lunar mansion Mula, I mentioned at the beginning of Sagittarius, the most destructive one in the way, the goddess of death, right? And this is about really uprooting all of our negative beliefs and all our old beliefs and the old paradigm, basically. So that was all going on at the same time. So... Take a breather. Here's, here's a chart for you to look at when I take a, a sip of water. And Donald Trump, <laughs> I bet you're thinking, oh God, now it just like we're getting rid of Pluto in Capricorn. And now you're asking me to like think about Pluto in Capricorn until 2040. And now you're getting me to look at Donald Trump again. <laughs> but basically the reason why I picked Donald Trump is because he's a good example of how someone who can be so divisive is actually for the astrology community a really uniting force in, a bit, in many ways because he's got the same rising degree in both tropical and sidereal. So he's Leo rising. Now, do you think there's any debate about him being Leo rising? I don't think so. I don't think we could say, oh, maybe he's Virgo. No, no, he's definitely Leo in, Virgo, in, in both. So you can see this is what I mean. It just makes it more obvious. Now, have a look at, maybe you're more used to looking at tropical. Have a look at the, now I've just made it easy in whole sign houses. So you can compare the two, but maybe have a look at the tropical and see what you would see there and what you'd explain there. I will just do the same with sidereal. And this is what happens over and over again. And there's no point getting into debates with people because whatever system you use explains the person. So I could use sidereal just as much as you would use your tropical if you're using that. And it would be, it would be correct. You know, I, I have no problem having two systems that work to explain the person. It's like having two different languages, French and Italian, to describe a person. Yes, you're speaking a different language, but you're describing the person. So these are just two different languages. So I could say, for example, I think I took a note here. So one thing you might say about tropical, okay, his uh, Leo rising, sun in Gemini with the north node in Uranus. This guy in the 11th house, full sign house. This guy really likes to exaggerate himself. You might say, right? Lord of the second and the 11th in the 11th, Mercury, or Sun. Sorry, Lord of the second and the 11th are the same for Leo, for all Leos. That's why Leos tend to exaggerate themselves, let's face it. Um, I'm mooning Leo, by the way, Sagittarius, so I can do the same. Um, but his son is there, his ruler, and that's how you describe, you might describe him tropically as he is someone who exaggerates and contradicts himself every turn with sun in Gemini, north node in Uranus. Would you not? Yeah? What would I say? I would say, actually, no, look at his sidereal. His Mercury is in <laughs> Gemini, the second Lord and the 11th Lord in the 11th house is Mercury and it's in Gemini. So it's, is it that he is, is that, or is that he speaks that? Is it that he actually is more contradictory in his speech? Which is it? It's both, you could say. Uh, because I would, might say with the sidereal that his son is actually in Taurus because he's more about, his being is about accumulating assets to make himself feel big. Sun and North Node. Right? Mm -hmm. And that black hole, right on the black hole, his moon, he was born on an eclipse, of course, a lunar eclipse, and it's right at the edge of Scorpio. And so all of that accumulation of things up in the 10th house in Taurus is a compensation for his emotional sense of instability and his lack at home, right? He's got to prove himself in the world. He's got to make something of himself in the world. But again, you can look at both systems, tropical and sidereal, and see that they both work. 
and tell different stories based on, you know, where the moon is, whether it's in the fourth house, whole sign house, or in the top column, kind of fifth. You can easily spin a story. And it's like we were talking about later, uh, earlier, um, Ricky and I were talking a lot about, you know, if they're all words, we all just use words to describe ourselves. And then we hook into them words and they create this kind of identity around words we're using. And we could just choose other words based on a different system and then realize, actually, there's this other part of me that is, was lying dormant until I mentioned this. Here you go, there you are. So it's like, it's language is so important, isn't it? But anyway, that's Donald Trump. Um, you might see other things um, in his chart, but I want to go back to one last thing before I finish up. Um, just showing you the end of the slide. So <laughs> here we go back to this thing I skipped over. So the other thing is, like I said, I'm a neo-Vedic astrologer, I guess. And that's because I use the outer planets, even though I'm actually, in terms of using the astrology, very traditional and I follow the rule book, right? But it's like, again, that kind of notion of you have to really know the rules really well before you break them. And it took me maybe 10, 15 years to start breaking them a little bit or bending them. Um, and bringing in these outer planets. Now, at the same time, I don't bring them in fully in that, and I'll show you how. But let me just note that some astrologers, Vedic astrologers incorporate them. I do. Many do not do that, and they get by with Rahu Ketu, and I did for years. So for the first 10 years of practice, I think I, I got by with Rahu Ketu. They explained everything that was going on. Why did I need the outer planets? Um, but then I added them, and then it was like a whole other level. <laughs> But it, not a whole other level in just in terms of outer level, like the transpersonal, you might say, because when I started writing mundane reports, I felt I needed them, but actually a whole other level, a level internally as well, I think more so. Because the further out, um, what I've gathered with astrology is the further something out it is, the further, some, uh, the further in it is, the deeper in it is. Like Pluto is so far out there. It's like, how the hell does that influence me? But it does deeply influence me. Um, but I would say that because I'm <coughs> Scorpio. <laughs> so um, Western astrologers are actually often referring to, I've seen this more and more in recent years, the nodes as Rahu Ketu. They're actually using those terms. So basically, they're even by saying the word Rahu, a bit A accentuated, it's a powerful word to even say as a mantra. Rahu. It's like Ra. It's like it is, there's something very powerful about Rahu. Um, and so you, you're incorporating, and if you can incorporate them and listen to reports from sidereal astrologers talking about the lunar nodes transits, you really gather a lot. Um, but also the myth, especially the myth, which I don't have time to go into here, but uh, Rahu is often likened to Uranus, of course. They both rule Aquarius, traditional Jyotish. Rahu rules Aquarius. Modern astrology, Uranus rules Aquarius. There you go. <laughs> There's the tide. Um, examples of this also are Rahu's age of maturity, because in Indian astrology, there's ages of maturity for planets, um, where Rahu matures at age 42, which just so happens to be when Uranus makes its way around and poses the natal position. So you might say the midlife crisis. And then Rahu also, in terms of right now, is transiting Taurus, and that is telling the same story as tropical astrologers would be when they talk about Uranus in tropical Taurus. Ketu, the south node, is likened to Pluto because they actually both rule Scorpio. Traditionally, Ketu rules Scorpio in Indian astrology and in modern day Pluto. So they're similar. Both are likened to Neptune in many ways, but actually both substitute all of them in many ways. But Ketu, especially um, more so with Neptune, because there's an association with Ketu, the south node, and Pisces, which in modern, in modern astrology, Neptune is said to rule Pisces. So this is, way, this is the way I incorporated it initially. I'm being, I'm more and more open-minded to the modern interpretations of Uranus, Neptune, and Pluto, but this is how I started, and I still use this to this day, and it really works really well. And it's this concept that Ernst Wilhelm describes really well in this YouTube channel, uh, KRS channel, where he describes Uranus, Neptune, and Pluto like the three impulses of Vedic thought, Rajas, Sattva, Tamas, or creative, preservative, and destructive. And so the, if if you actually just study these three impulses, because every planet sign, everything is one, well, it's a mix of all three, but it's predominantly one of these usually, um, you'll understand a lot of astrology straight off the bat. So if you just correlate Uranus with Rajas, which is this need to create, creation then can come in all kinds of forms, which can be unpredictable and unexpected and volatile, like having a baby, having a creation, having a creative process, having a breakthrough moment, 
Like you don't make an omelet without breaking eggs and all of that, right? That's Uranus. Neptune could be correlated with sattva or the impulse to preserve, to maintain life no matter the form. And so it's like that vision in your mind's eye of the thing or the person or that house I lived in 10 years ago. And it's like, I no longer live there, but I still have that beautiful house in my mind or the lover that I had 20 years ago or whatever it is. It's like, they're still alive in your mind. You're keeping them alive in your mind's eye. That's Neptune. That's the preservative quality of sattva. And then finally, Pluto is tamas, which is this need to destroy and transform, change and transcend, which is quite clearly Pluto. So one last concept here though, is that you could actually correlate them with these three gods of Indian thought. And in his article, Pluto and Neo-Vedic view, Vedic astrologer Dennis Harness recounts a meeting with Narendra Desai who claimed he saw an ancient nadi leaf in the museum in Madras, India, predicting three important planets would be discovered by the astrologers of the modern age, the Kali Yuga. So it was predicted in India that these three planets would be discovered. So he goes on to write that according to the ancient palm leaf, the names of the planets would be uh, Prajapati, the god of creation. Again, you can correlate that with Uranus. Varuna, the god of sustenance, like Neptune and Yama, the god of death, like Pluto. And it's easy to see the correlations there. So a few suggestions before I finish up. Basically, what I would say is, because this is what I've done, so I don't know, maybe you want to follow my footsteps, I don't know. Um, maybe you don't want to be an outsider, <laughs> but maybe you do, and maybe you want to open your mind to different ways of looking at it and actually you know, create a lot in the process. So sidereal observers could gain a lot from listening to tropical transit reports. I certainly do. Tropical observers gain a lot from sidereal reports based on the notes. Recognize that nobody practices purely Western or Eastern astrology. There's no such thing as purebred. Only tropical or sidereal. That's, so you're either doing tropical or sidereal, but you can see here that you can actually do both of those too. Um, Patrick Watson suggests renaming the tropical signs, um, a way to reconcile the tropical and sidereal zodiacs. This is his article where he actually suggests new names for tropical signs. It would actually be a lot more clear, actually, if we did that, um, instead of having to keep saying tropical Aries, sidereal Aries. You know what I mean? It's like this kind of a mouthful. Um, other thing you can do is to, um, this is, this is controversial, this next one. Uh, because some Vedic astrologers have begun now to separate tropical sun signs from sidereal lunar matches. And so everything I just gave you is like blown apart. And so that they're not tied at all together. And they say that the sun signs should be connected to the solstices and equinoxes and the lunar mansions purely sidereal and they should be separate. And, it, and I did try it. I did try it for a whole year. It wasn't easy. And I really tried it for a year. I didn't just half try it. I really tried it. The problem is when you're so trained in one system, it's very hard to drop all your preconceived notions and ideas about it. And I just couldn't get my head around. It. And, and again, that throwing out the whole intricate connection between the sun signs and lunar mansions was really tough because they're just, they, it's like an x-ray vision. They explain such intricacy of the signs and also the interaction between the divisional charts and all of that and the microscopic details. So I couldn't basically, and I had to drop it. But anyway, I'm not saying it doesn't work. Um, but I, I just didn't work it for myself. But anyway, another suggestion is to do Persian astrology, practice Persian, like Tajika, it's called in India, which you would probably do. I mean, as a Western astrologer, you probably do that, horror, um, as well as solar returns, which again are an overlap because solar return charts of Varshapal and Indian astrology use the same aspects and all of the same, basically, calculations, um, progress, signs, and all of that. It's all the same. So that actually, there are more in common, really, than you think. And then whatever approach you adapt, use your tried and tested techniques when helping clients. They couldn't care less about the techniques you want, you're using. They just want clear guidance. They really couldn't care less. So, and let's keep sharing knowledge is my suggestion, whatever you choose to label it. This was my, just to finish, okay. very indulgent of myself. This was my question. But me. I've already told you, I've already told you. You see, you so Okay. No, but what, what is my rising sign? Do you think, looking at me, if rising sign is actually your physical body? The moon Leo, sun Scorpio. But what is the rising sign? You're correct, yeah, but what is my rising sign? No, I'm giving you, I'm giving you a choice between Scorpio and Sagittarius. Which do you think? Just your gut instinct. Sag. Interesting. What was your gut instinct, by the way? Gemini. 
<laughs> no, no, you got to choose between Scorpio and Sagittarius. You got to choose between Scorpio and Sagittarius. Oh. Which gut instinct? My gut instinct would have been Sagittarius. Int no, this is really good to hear because yeah. you all. I am Are well. I am tropical Sagittarius. Yes. Yeah. And Sagittarius Scorpio. Mm -hmm. Really interesting. How I, I imagine. I don't know. Do you but all you, practice Western like tropical astrology? You feel Scorpio Sagittarius. Is that what you feel inside? Yes, I'm going to show you that now. So I want to tell you a little brief story, though, because this is funny, because when I first had my horoscope calculated, I got the wrong time from my mom, 9 a.m. Mm -hmm. And I had my tropical chart done up, and it was Scorpio rising. But that was the wrong time. It was a much later time, 12.53, and it should have been Sagittarius. But I got Scorpio rising. But then in the meantime, my teacher, Pearl Finn, changed to sidereal around that time. Then I got my right time, and then she did my chart again in Sidereal. It was still Scorpio. Uh -huh. I was like, still in Scorpio. So I didn't get that Sagittarius initially, yeah. right? But I am Sidereal Scorpio, Tropical Sagittarius rising. So, and I could identify with both. So, Tropical Sagittarius for sure, and Sidereal Scorpio in different ways. Though. So, Sagittarius is definitely symbolic of how I operate on a certain level my love of freedom, travel, definitely philosophical nature. I'm a teacher. There are indications in my chart which also clearly show this in my sidereal chart. Scorpio, though, describes many of the things in my life that I'd rather not share, and that's a big portion of my life that I wouldn't share with anyone. That is good. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely wouldn't share with anyone. Um, and I'm more physically, according to Parashara in his textbook, Grit Pat Parashara, um, more typically Scorpio, lean, slender, hairy. That's not how he describes it. Now, he's very unclear about Sagittarius. He just calls him even bodies. But I'm definitely kind of more Scorpio in my physicality, I would say. And we could argue that actually, because the Sagittarius is closer to the actual constellations, that it is actually more physical, that it's a physical thing in Scorpio, whereas my tropical Sagittarius is more my character, maybe, you know? Um, but finally, I was actually born in that Gandanta section. We're very close to it. And another sign, quote unquote, <laughs> of, of Hucus, the 13th sign, quote unquote, of the zodiac. Uh, and the, but the symbolism of the ficus is really, really my life in a nutshell. So we couldn't separate that out either, right? So now I'm giving you tropical, sidereal, lunar mansion, and now this, like four levels, four layers of me, right? All stuck here in one, one piece. And they all describe me. So the serpent bear describes my life and this Kundalini Shakti and sexual energy, which generally you would say for Scorpio, this is an issue. But for Sagittarius, you might say, you could say maybe tropical, that is more elevated. But I've struggled with this my whole life to elevate the sexual impulse into something else. And this Gandanta or gap here between Scorpio and Sagittarius. I remember one astrologer um, describing it to me, Sanjira, as like a gap in the pavement. It's like you're peering out at life in the gap in the pavement. And that's basically how I live my life. I'm like just peering out at everything all the time in my kind of cocoon, in my shell, if you will. So the end of Sagiri Scorpio is where we find Jeshta. And uh, the symbolism of that is actually an umbrella or a talisman. It's all about um, having achieved a skill, a private or secret knowledge, especially, that is used as a protection against evil all of that, right? So it's very Scorpionic at the end of Scorpio. But basically, this is ruled by Indra. Indra is the chief of the gods, and he's the deity that compels us to take control of our earth-based desires. But all of the stories in Vedic myth about Indra was that he was losing his power and having to regain it again. So he's always losing his power. He's always trying to stay in control, which is the theme of Scorpio, of course. Um, and, but basically, he's about elevating us on a spiritual quest. And it's a challenging section, that section between Scorpio and Sagittarius, for that reason. And that's basically been the theme of my life. So I'm all four of them. I've got four different signs now to think about. So anyway, thank you all for listening to my ramblings. Um, if, you have, if you want more information, my website is timelineastrology.com, or you can support me on patreon.com forward slash timelineastrology. I do daily reports for patrons. I have a podcast, public podcast videos, a magazine. I'm going to give you a magazine here, those who came. <laughs> and um, also the Lunar Mansions. So again, you can go to the website. If you want to actually, you'd have to sign up as a patron though. I only printed them for patrons. And also the Scorpio Video Club, a nice uh, Scorpio Video Club here, where basically I share a lot of the secrets of Indian astrology. And maybe also talk about things that might otherwise be quite controversial because I can feel I can be 
because it's for a select few, uh, an audience of just patrons, I think about 50 something patrons at the moment. So I can just share my videos about certain things that publicly I might not want to share. I don't know, because it's controversial or whatever. Scorpio, for God's sake. <laughs> so if you want to have a look anyway, it's time on astrology. The artist is Samir Rana. So his website is actually ranasamir.com. If you think Rana, Samir. And he has these cards, or he, he made these cards for me. And I wrote text on the back just to give you a bit of just insight into each sign, good lunar matching, and what they all symbolize. And yeah. For those who came, I'll give you a, a physical copy of the magazine, this year's magazine, so it's a bit old now, but um, there's still a couple of months left. And uh, thank you all. Thank you. Yeah. That's personal. What you're doing there is raised it's something that I have to stop about all the time. I find it really, really relevant. So every time I'm talking about saving symbols or anything, I have to always come back, let's talk about Sidereal. That's so where I'm up to. Mm. You go into much more detail. But we were, you were just suggesting to me then that perhaps because this room we don't have direct access to the chat room, so we thought we'd just have a quick check on the chat room to see if there are any questions. Yeah. Right. Because right. there might be some people up there. Yeah, yeah, okay. Um, if, if there are some questions there, because this is the one room that doesn't have hmm. the extra computer. So. I'll stop that note. So shall I stop the? Is it stop stop share? Isn't it? That's one word. Stop share. I'll just press yeah, stop share. Oh, and this one here. Yeah. 